to put um, chapter 8 up there. And so what I want to do is I want to walk through these scriptures so that we're clear about them. Um, and then I can share with you some of what God's put on my heart. In verse 2, it talks about the Macedonian church giving. What's interesting is their poverty didn't prevent them from giving. Their poverty did not prevent them from giving. See, in, the, in, our, in our thinking, our thinking is, I don't, I don't have enough. But in the kingdom, you do. Their poverty, the little that they had, didn't prevent them from giving to be a blessing to others. Right? So you're going to keep hearing me refer to uh, Abraham. Remember we read in Abraham way back in the first message. Uh, God says, I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. And the fact that you're a blessing, is that's what this is. Right? The blessing isn't contingent on, being a blessing isn't contingent upon how much you have. So in their poverty, they gave. The thinking is, I don't, I don't, I'm poor, I don't have enough, so I can't give. I know that sounds, that sounds bad. But not in the kingdom. Remember, the kingdom is like upside down. It's paradoxical. So you give, even when you don't have as much as you'd like to have. And all the scriptures we read, God says he'll pour out resources so that you will have. Uh, also in verse 2, it says a joy-filled heart. Right? That there's a joy in giving. And I believe having joy in your heart leads to generous giving. Yes. When you're thankful and when you're happy of all that God's done for you and you are rehearsing all the goodness of God, it's easy to give. When you're mad and complaining all the time, probably not so much. Not, not so much. It's probably not that, that, that easy to give. But when you're thankful, when, when your heart is full of thanksgiving for the things of God and all that God's done for us, despite what we may not have, it sets something up in our spirit to be generous. Giving money, uh, in verse 3, it says giving money uh, should be a, a free will. It should be a free will. Right? You should never feel pressured to give. Nobody should ever pressure you. You should never feel pressured to give any, anything, ever. One of the reasons, one of the reasons we, we have these boxes up here is so we don't take offerings. We don't, so, so you have on your own free will to come up because we believe that giving offerings and tithing is honor to God. So during your worship, our worship time, that's why these boxes are here. Not because somebody's going to stand up here and then preach and give you a great message and then pass the collection plate. We, we don't ever want you to feel pressured to give. Should be, it should be your heart and your heart to do it because of your joy and because of what, what you have in God. Yes. It's interesting. It says their first action was to give themselves to the Lord first and then to the apostles first to God and then, and then the apostles. And so I, I believe that when we give our, our, our hearts to God first, and we give ourselves to the church, it's easy then to give the money. You know, here's the thing that's interesting about giving money. It's the lowest form of trusting God. Yes. Come on now. Say that again. To demonstrate our trust for God, giving money is the lowest way of doing it. Yes. A lot of times we think it's, it's a big, it's, a, it's not. It's the lowest form of trusting God is giving money. Because the Bible says, 
that uh, if, you, if you can't be faithful in doing that, how can you be faithful with true riches? Yes. The, the, the spiritual things of the kingdom that are really the true riches of the kingdom. And so if we, if we find it difficult to trust God in giving money, then it's going to be difficult for God to trust you with true riches. Verse 8, there is no command to give offering. Let me just, let me just tease this out so you all are clear. Free will does not mean God doesn't have an expectation of us. You follow me? Yes. Free, will, free will doesn't mean that God has no expectation. Free will just simply means I can do it or I cannot do it. Right. And I don't have to worry about being cursed if I don't do it. It doesn't mean that God doesn't have an expectation for us to do it. Because, our, again, Abraham, I will be a blessing to you. I will bless you. Your name will be famous. And you will be a blessing. This is God saying that he, this is his expectation, is that you would be a blessing. So while I have free will to do it, it doesn't change God's expectation that we, we are to be a blessing. So free will does not mean no expectation. Doesn't mean no expectation. God still has an expectation of us. Loving God leads to generous giving. Yes. Paul is saying here in verse 8 that he's going to make this comparison of the Macedonian church. He um, says, I am, I am not commanding you to do this, but I am testing how genuine your love is. How genuine is your love? Is, is your love so genuine that you'll reach into your pocket? This is what he's saying. I'm going, to, I'm going to test how genuine your love is. We'll see. Let's reach into your pocket. And he's comparing it. He's comparing what they give to what the churches in Macedonia who didn't have much. One is your giving in line with your love for God. One. Two, he is saying, they don't have very much in Macedonia, and they gave a large amount. I'm going to compare what you give to what they give. Now, that's, that's Paul's thing. That's not our thing. But it's interesting that he's looking at how much they have, because at this point, they are a blessed church. The church is blessed. And um, the churches that have already gave in Macedonia, they were not blessed, but they were willing to give anyway. And so he's saying, well, I'm going to make a comparison about your genuine love because these churches over here did a great deal. Let's see how much you love God. Now, here's the thing that's interesting about these scriptures. On the one hand, Paul says it's free will. But when you break this out, it's like, He's coming at them pretty strong and pretty hard about being generous. Verse 12, look at, look at verse 12. It says, whatever you give is acceptable as long as you give it eagerly, cheerfully. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. And give according to what you have, not what you don't have. Whatever you give is acceptable, as long as you give it cheerfully. If you give it begrudgingly, then it's really not from your heart. And God knows our heart when we gave it. So what was the motivation for giving it? He wants, us to, he wants us to give in joy because he wants us to be able to participate in what he wants to do in blessing whatever he wants to bless. 
He wants us to be part of that in a joyful way, not in a, 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 a way that we feel under compulsion. You give in proportion to what you have, not what you don't have. So if you have $1,000, it's $2 proportionate, or if you have $10, is $8 proportionate. I don't know. I think that's something that you got to sort of talk to God about. And let God move on your heart about what's proportionate and what's not proportionate. I said this last time. I've said this a few times. I'll probably say it again. God's not trying to get anything from us. He's trying to get something to us. 2 Corinthians, uh, we go there. He says this, remember, God's loss of sowing and reaping. This up. Go to the next. God's law of sowing and reaping. So a farmer who plants a little, few seeds, will get a crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. That's in verse 6. And he's saying, remember this because this is, this is, this is, this is why we forget. Everybody, everybody wants harvest time. We all love harvest time. We always want the blessing from God. Harvest time is a great time. But he's saying, remember that harvest time is preceded by seed sowing planting time. And so you don't get disappointed in harvest time. Remember seed time. Well, God, I was expecting this, but I only got this. Remember this, that if you sow a little, you're going to get a little. If you sow generously, you'll reap generously. Remember this. Here's the other thing about this is God is saying that there is no fixed income in the kingdom of God. There's no such thing as a fixed income. It's only fixed if you don't do anything. Because when I read this, I said it says if, if I sow, I'll reap. The more I sow, the more I reap. There's nothing fixed about that. See, that's why it's the kingdom of God, kingdom financial prosperity, and not worldly prosperity. Because in the world, your income can be fixed. Not in the kingdom of God. Not in the kingdom of God. It's not fixed. Isn't that great? Yes. <laughs> you know, for a long time, there were a lot of faith folks that just said, you know, name it and claim it. Name it and claim it. Well, I believe you can claim it after you sow seed. <laughs> You, 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 can't, you can't claim anything if you haven't sown anything. Because claiming something when you haven't done anything is foolishness and presumption. And, and quite frankly, stupid. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to try to claim something when you haven't done anything. But when you've sown generously, 
God, God said, I will bless you generously. So you can claim that generous blessing. God wants you to. He wants you to have faith in him and trust in him that his word is true and that he's going to do what he said he's going to do. Here's the other thing that's interesting about sowing and reaping. There is a time in between. That's called patient waiting. That's where we get to trust God. That's where we get to learn that God is our provider. Right? We don't we don't plant seed on Monday and then have a crop of wheat on Tuesday. Eight months, nine months. There's there's a waiting period. And we've got to be able to be patient and wait and trust God. That his word will come to pass. That's the hard part. Yes. But I believe God wants us to do that. I believe he wants us to trust. Wants us to trust him. And wants us, wants us to trust his word. Yes. Yeah. says in verse 7, you should decide. You should decide in your heart what to give, and you should never feel pressure to give. God loves a cheerful giver. You know, here's what I would always say. This is just, this is just me. Decide what you're going to give when you're at home. Yes. Before you even get to church. It's you, you've talked to God, you've waited on God, you've done whatever you need to do with God. You don't wait till you get to church and somebody says something exciting and then after you go to church, boy, I wish I would have done that. <laughs> decide, decide at home. Just decide at home. And it eliminates feeling pressured or getting hyped or whatever. Just, just plan. God, God, God loves a cheerful giver. I, I can't say that enough. He wants your heart to be for what his heart is for. And he wants you to be happy about that. That he's asked you to be part of being a blessing. That's phenomenal. Yes. That God has called us to be a blessing with him. Pretty cool. Yes. Verse 8, it says, The promise, this is the promise. I like the way Paul writes this because he's pretty emphatic. And he says, And God will generously provide all you need. God might provide all you need. God could provide all you need. God will generously provide all you need. That's the promise. The promise is that God will provide, generously provide all you need. This is, this is kingdom living. This is kingdom living. This isn't, this isn't some, 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 some new kind of, new way kind of Christian thinking. This is kingdom living. This is the way we live our lives and the kingdom every day. If we say we're part of the kingdom, these are the instructions on how to live kingdom. Is then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over 
to share with others. God wants to give generously to you so that you have some left over so you can stick it away in your sock and put it in a drawer. No, no, no. So you can be a blessing. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. He's going to give you more than what you need so that what you have left over, you can now give. It's, you can't even preach this because it's so clear. Yeah. It's, it's, you can just read the scripture, which is why I, I said just play it. Because when you read it, it's like, okay. Now either I have to believe it and do it, or I cannot believe it and do it. But it's pretty clear. Plenty left over. To share. You know, here's the thing that's interesting. When when Jesus fed the 5,000 and he fed the 4,000, they were leftovers. Remember that? Leftovers. And he says, pick up the scraps. There's always leftover. When God multiplies something in your life, there will be leftover. Now the question is, what do you do with your left though? Remember, remember in, this, in, the, in the earlier passage, it says, he'll give you bread to eat and seed to sow. Bread to eat and seed to sow. We have to have a wisdom to be able to understand what's my bread to eat and what is it that I sow. Look at verse 10. So here you go. God is the one who provides seed to the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. That second part is pretty interesting. Because what he's saying is when you give, one of the things that's going to happen when you, when, you, when you are a giver is that he actually is going to give you the desire to want to give more. Yes. Yes. That, that he actually puts in you this desire to want to give. So the more you give, the greater your desire to give becomes. Because it says that he will provide an increase and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. That there is this desire in you that God puts in you to be generous. The Bible says, when you delight yourself in me, I'll give you the desires of your heart. Meaning, the very desire that you have is what gets put in you. And because God put that desire in your heart, that's the desire that he will fulfill because it started with him. It didn't start with you. It wasn't just a great idea that you had. It's something that started with God. God dropped it in your spirit. Now he wants to fulfill what he put in your spirit because it came from him. It wasn't a great idea that you had. It wasn't a great idea that you had. The desire that you have in your heart is the desire that God put in your heart. He put that there. You just didn't think of that. The Bible says that God's the one who's given you the ability to get wealth. By giving you ideas and abilities and different ways of being able to do things and think about things that help you gain money, get money. That starts with God. It doesn't start with us. And he's saying that I'll do that and I'll put in you this, this heart of generosity. Okay. So, so what we see here is 
um, in verse 10, that God's given us this spiritual law of increasing our resources. It says, for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat in the same way he will provide and increase your resources. He will provide and increase your resources. When you, when you read, when you read a, a story of Abraham, you, you see him on his journey, his trek, that he just accumulates wealth. He just accumulates it and accumulates it and accumulates it. Here's the other thing that's interesting. The Bible says, Lot that was with him became rich too. Why did Lot become rich? Lot became rich because he was with Abraham. The blessing that's on you can rub off on others. That if they're with you, they get blessed too. Right? If you read the 26th chapter of Acts, you see when they're in, when Paul and all his comrades were in a ship, they were, they were being shipwrecked. Paul said, look, the angel spoke to me last night, and he says, all who stay on this boat with me will be okay. But if you leave this ship, you are on your own and you are going to die. But because you're with me, you're going to live. Because God's going to bring me safely to this island. The ship is going to break up. We're going to be shipwrecked, but we're all going to get there safe, safely because God is with me. And if you're with me, you're good. Because the blessing was on Paul, the blessing is on us. And so people that are close to us get blessed. It, it rubs off on them. Verse 12, it says, so, so two things, two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. <coughs> Don't be looking for somebody to thank you. Don't be looking for somebody to thank you. I mean, people are polite, they'll say thank you, but don't be looking for people to sort of like bow down to you. Here's the two good things. One, you met a need, and two, they'll thank God that, they, that God used you to meet their need. And the fact that they thank God means that they truly understand that it was God who really met their need and not you. You just happen to be the conduit through which God used to get the need met. Right, remember I read last week where the guy, the guy says, Jesus tells him, he says, hey, you're going to see this donkey. Yeah. Right? If you see anybody, tell them the Lord needs it. Well, when they went there, they saw the owners. Right? And the owner says, what are you doing with that donkey? He says, the Lord needed it. He said, okay, take it. <laughs> right? So the owner was just the conduit right. for what, what, what Jesus needed to do what he needed to do. And so we are just conduits. When we don't recognize or when we don't see that what we have is ours and we say to God, God, all that I have is yours, then that opens us up to be used by God. So if he wants to transfer money, right? You know, you can go online on your bank account and you can move money from here to there and from there to here. And God uses us because he wants to transfer money from these pockets to those pockets. He wants to transfer money from these pockets to those pockets. And when we are open for that, he'll use us that way. Amen. Thank you, Lord. The pitfall What, what, what gets us hung up is, what about me? And this is the part that we've got to push back on 
Because God says that when you seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, everything else will be provided to you. Yes. He says that I will bless you. Yes. God's job is to be a blessing to you. God's job is to be a blessing to you. God's job is to be a blessing to you. That's his job. My job is to be a blessing. I'm going to let God do his job. I'm going to do my job. I'm not going to say, well, I'm not doing anything until God does his job. I'd be careful with that. Just saying. I'd be careful with that. Because the only reason you bre you're breathing is because God's done his job. <laughs> Seriously. So let's let him do his, and we can do ours, and we see how beautifully things work. Yes. How beautifully things work. But we do have to trust him. We do have to trust him. And trust is an, an, an increasing endeavor. I said this before, but it bears repeating. There is no way had God given Abraham Isaac in year two, when he asked Abraham or instructed Abraham to sacrifice him, that he would have. I don't believe he would have because his trust and his faith in God would not have produced the trust and faith to be able to sacrifice him. Right. He would have hedged. Yes. And sometimes God waits to pour out his blessing on us because when he comes and says, I need you to give X amount, he doesn't want us to hedge. See, God wants to bless us richly, generously. But the same generous blessing he gave you, he might come and ask you for. He might come and ask you for it to give it to somebody else. Will you be willing to part with it? See, there's nothing to say that God won't ask you for. But we have to be in a position where our faith and our trust has developed enough that whatever he asks us for, we will willingly and freely give it. That trust doesn't just come like that. It doesn't just come like that. And so God, he puts these seasons in our life where we have to wait and we have to be patient. For Moses, I mean, for, for uh, Abraham, it was 25 years. It's 25 years. Plus, because I can't remember how old Isaac was when he asked him, probably eight, somewhere between 8 and 10, I think. When he asked him to sacrifice him. So 30 something years. We either have to believe. That all we have is his. If we don't believe that. We'll struggle with this. At the center at the center of all things, certainly giving, is our love for God and our love for the things of God, what God wants. When I love God and I love what God wants, then I make myself available to be a conduit to make that happen. That's kingdom living. That's, that's living in the kingdom. That I am a, I'm a, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. 
and as a citizen of the kingdom of God, not only do I inherit certain things, I'm also a contributor. I'm a contributor to the things of God. To help the kingdom flourish, to extend it. The Bible says that without faith, it's impossible. Not say, not difficult. Impossible. It's without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so when we're when we're talking about money, and we also have to talk about faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. So the things that we do with our money has to be done in faith. If I, don't, if I don't have faith, chances are I'm not going to do it because I don't believe. Cass is going to go through our website, but I've got a, a blog, if you haven't seen it, on believing. It's called Seeing is Believing or is Believing Seeing? Do we trust God? This is, this, is, this is what I find interesting. We've already said, you can have my life. Is my life more important than my money? Or is my money more important than my life? We already gave them our life. So is my life more important or less important? I would say it's more important because he didn't ask your money to be saved. Your money isn't gonna, 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 gonna go to heaven or hell. See the reality, the reality is Money is just a tool. It's just a tool. That's why on the grand scheme of things, it has low prioritization in the things of God. Because it's just a tool. In our world, we've built identity around money. Paul, when he writes to Timothy, he says, teach the people that are rich not to put their trust in money because it's so fleeting. It's so fleeting. Teach them not to put their trust in money. Because the most important things in life have nothing to do with money. Right? When you're sick, you're not thinking how much or how little money you have. You're like, Lord, heal me. Let's say.